Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to another Listen with Vobes. I'm Richard Vobes. It is four o'clock here in the UK and uh, my phone is just telling me that I'm now live, which is great. I thought I knew that. Uh, when I wake up in the morning, I knew I was alive. Anyway, uh, welcome along to another reading of, um, what is it called? Children of the Archbishop by Norman Collins. And we are on part six of our videos that we, what I'm making. And uh, goodness knows what chapter we are now and whatever, but uh, it's all very exciting. But before we get back to that, a uh, quick hello, first of all, to everybody who's uh, joined us. Thank you very much for coming along. It's lovely to see you. The lovely Julia is out there. Uh, Tall Rog Podge. No, Tall Podge Rog, in fact. Uh, Turbo Stream and uh, Cooper Air 68. Mr. Cooper 68. Dave over yonder. Philip Hammond and Mary, good afternoon. Great to see the three of you earlier today. Oh, yes, uh, Mary rang on the WhatsApp to the old Vobi. And Julia had popped round uh, because she was coming into Worthing. I said, come in, you're in my bubble, have a cup of tea, have some beans on toast. We'll take Joe down to the pier. So we did. And um, I'm wearing another of uh, Mary's creations. I know I've got another blue one, but this is the second of the blue ones. This is uh, even better than the other one. It's got a lovely, lovely warm neck to it. And everything about it is warm, actually. And then Mary said, yes, about your spring collection, Richard. I, I want to talk to you about that. <laughs> I said, all right. Uh, so we may, we may try a cardigan next time round. A nice little, you know, a little cardy with a couple of pockets in. I have to get the pipe out and a smoking hat and uh, all that sort of malarkey. Anyway, nice to see you there, Mary. Um, which is great. And uh, Lee Lawson, watch everyone. The utility has made the tea, so all is well. Oh, good. And uh, good afternoon to Audrey Forbes and Justine Jones, who has also arrived. Lovely to see you all. Thank you very much. I have a cup of coffee here. Dark blue, very nice. Thank you very much. Um, yes, they're very, they're very nice. I can't now go back to wearing commercially bought stuff handmade is the way to go uh so uh, yes it's it's very nice and of course you know um they appear in the videos so it's all tax deductible shush did i say that out loud i don't think i did anyway uh so we're going to carry on with that but before we carry on with that lee lawson has suggested another book and somebody else suggested a book which i have ordered and it's on its way so we've got two new books to potentially do after this this one which is called the thames to the solent is a classic by jb dashwood and i think i've read bits of this before i don't think i have ever owned a copy but i thought there was a free copy online at one point but when i was doing stuff on canals in the, in the days of uh, my podcast years and years ago, the Vogue Show podcast, I mean, talking, I don't know, 2006, 2007, that sort of time, um, I, I first came across this, and it's about a, a chap and his mate uh, who go on a journey from the Thames down the Way and Arran Canal, and uh, they get down to the coast to the Solent and and they go across a number of different canals uh, and it's, it's uh, just trying to think when it was 18 something or other uh, when when was it first published just looking just looking first published 1868 there we go 1868 uh, and it's a sort of a story of it um, of their journey a bit like three men in a boat but uh, two men and has he got a dog i can't remember if he's got a dog anyway so that's uh it's a slim little no number we can probably knock that out in a couple of weeks uh so that's something to look forward to so uh, there you go so thank you to uh, lee who um ordered the book and had it sent to me so there we go yeah thank you so much lee much appreciated if anybody's got any suggestions for books do keep them coming we've got uh sean james cameron has sent me another one by tickner edwards some while back called neighborhood i think it's called um and we've got peep show as well the original first peep show of walter wilkins so you know there's, there's there are books in the pipeline uh, from authors that we've gone through but it's nice to have a couple of authors that we haven't if you see what i mean anyway we're going to carry on with children of the archbishop 
uh, which is the first novel that we've done as such, which is grand. Uh, Edward Moulding is here. Need to catch up with it. Went walking the other day. Lost the house key. Oh, one hour walk turned into a three hour walk looking for the key. The question is, did you find the key? That's the thing. Sensible Paul. He says, I love bread pudding. Excellent. Um, I'd love to, I'd love to, actually I'd love to make some bread pudding. I like used to love making bread and butter pudding which is nice. Uh, Dudley Sawyer is there. Good afternoon. I'm making a cup of tea. Milk in first. Or is it tea? Cripes. Can't get it wrong. No, mustn't get it wrong. And it's a brilliant book, says Tall Podge. Um, is it? Have you... Have you you've, the, the, uh, the Thames to the Solent. Oh, brilliant. Oh, I'm looking forward to that then. Tea in first, Dudley. According to the Milford's milk first is non-you. Oh, non-you. As long as it's not EU, we'll be all right. OK, we are on uh, wherever we were. Can't remember. So you've got itch on my back there. You get an itch on the lower of your back and then you can't quite ever get rid of it. Dr Trump, that's right. Dr Trump, he's gone into the garden and uh, she, Miss Warple was crying and he, he became a little bit sorry for her. He opened his arms and said, oh, I'm... I'm so sorry for you. And she's just sprung into his arms. That was the, the last part of it. On the night of his engagement, so the story has obviously uh, gone on a little bit here now. On the night of his engagement, Dr Trump scarcely slept at all. He began with an uneasy pacing of the room, alternating with spells of despondent moodiness stretched out, nearly recumbent, in his wicker chair. Then, finding that sleep was further away than ever, he went down to the kitchen and made himself a cup of cocoa. The chief of his misgivings during the dreadful night when he won... Sorry, the chief of his misgivings during that dreadful night when he wondered exactly what it was that had occurred, whether he had boldly proposed or merely timidly accepted, was concerned with Felicity's potential motherliness. I'm not sure I understood that sentence, but never mind. Everything now seemed to turn upon that point. Did she, or did she not, want children? And if so, how many? Dr Trump then found himself asking of what sex? Not so much because he thought that Felicity could do anything in particular about it, as to see whether but as to see whether her views coincided, coincided with his own. As for him, his mind was quite made up. Four was to be the number, two boys and two girls, with, the, with a boy for the eldest. He was unprepared to make even the slightest concession. Each of, one of each, for example, would simply have been trifling with a problem. There could, however, he repeated to himself, be no possible compromise, no half measures. From the first moment he went... Sorry, I'm not reading at all well and I apologise for that, I don't know why. From the first moment when he had begun to think about such things, it must have been when he had first turned 15, that he pictured himself in the guise of a patriarch. Even the details had been clear to him. He had seen himself most clearly standing on an ancient rectory lawn, possibly a deanery lawn, and to an admiring group of lesser fry, vicars, curates and lay church workers, he was saying, My eldest is at Eton, the younger is at Radlett, the girls are both at Cheltenham, my wife's old school, you know. That reminded him. He must find out where Felicity had been educated. He must give depth and detail to an otherwise vague and shadowy picture. Because now that he came to think about it, he realised that he'd never properly thought about this remarkable woman, his mate, his mother of four. And only once had the possible mother of his children crossed his thoughts, not merely as a mother, but as a woman. Indeed, it was still astonished him to remember that evening in the children's playroom, playroom when he had seen Margaret putting up the decorations. Moreover, it was essentially as a mother that he had seen her. He still thought what a strangely moving picture she had made with the whiteness of her blouse showing up the blue-black lustre of her hair. But this was terrible. Simply terrible. He was appalled at the course of his thoughts 
at the course that his thoughts had taken him. Why, he was being practically unfaithful to Felicity before he'd even bought the engagement ring. And all the time he was saying to himself, but I should be so happy, so ecclesiastically happy. It is all that I could have dreamt of. I am betrothed, and to a bishop's daughter. So we're now on chapter uh, 13. Well, we went straight to children. Yes, I know. Well, he's be, he, he, see, the thing is, it seems that um, he wants to, Dr. Trump, from what I've seen and what I remember of it, and is, which is very vague, seems to be wanting to better himself all the way through. And he's very impressed by Dame Eleanor, who said you ought to be married. And he's like, oh, yes, maybe I should be married. And, of course, Dame Eleanor and Bishop Warple have this daughter. No, not to, between them, but Bishop... Bishop Warple has a daughter in which he's sort of now going to marry off to Dr Trump. And Dr Trump has been sort of pushed into it, thinking, yes, I need a wife, I need the children, and, of course, he doesn't really love her at all from what I'm getting from this. Anyway, chapter 13. Sweetie often wondered about the little boy who had visited her so suddenly in the middle of the night and had then gone away again without even saying goodbye. He had been a vague, rough sort of boy, she remembered, and his feet had kept getting on top of hers as they lay together. Also, he'd been wet. Like a used bath towel, though he could scarcely be blamed for that because of all the rain that was coming down outside. But it was his rudeness that she minded about most. After all, it wasn't a lot to ask of anyone that he should say thank you to a complete stranger who had taken him into bed simply because the police were after him. By now, Sweetie had pretty much given up all hope of ever meeting him again. The hospital was so large and there were hundreds and hundreds of other little boys to get mixed up with. And the wall down the centre was so high that even if, he, even if she knew his name and called out to him, he would never be able to hear. It was only on Sundays, in fact, that the boys and the girls ever came together, and that was in the chapel. But the boys all looked different then because of their white collars that they were wearing. And Sweetie expected that she must look different too, because the last time that particular boy had seen her, she was only wearing a nightdress. Not that it mattered very much either way. She had almost forgotten him, and he had probably forgotten all about her too. In any case, she had more than little boys to think about now. She was getting to be a big girl. She was six already. Getting on for seven. And she was going to, and she was going into first grade tomorrow. This meant upheaval, a different teacher, a different dormitory, so that even if the strange little boy should happen to come back to look for her, she, she wouldn't be there, and a different uniform. It hadn't altered since 1668, this uniform. Winter and summer alike, it was the same. A pillar box colour, red flannel blouse with a narrow white colour, white collar, stiff like a blank, like a bank's clerk, a blue serge skirt with a leather belt, and brass buckle for a waistband, black lace up shoes and black stockings, and a blue cape and hood lined with the same pillar box flannel. It was picturesque, historic, uncomfortable. Visitors were particularly affected by it, and Dr. Trump himself carried away by so much orphan and Dr. Trump himself carried away by so much orphan pageantry, had once enthusiastically declared that if he had his own way, he would make the uniform compulsory for all children everywhere. Sweetie would have been able to agree with him. She had lain awake at night thinking of that broad leather belt and its brass buckle, the most beautiful kind of belt in the world. The spike on the buttle, buckle was sharp enough to make holes in bits of paper, and the lace-up boots, they were worth keeping yourself from falling off to sleep, just so that you could go on remembering them. That was why it was so exciting 
to be standing at last in the clothes queue, with the peg girl and the lit and the girl with the thick curly hair like a sheepdog's, and the fat one who looked like a bear. It was the first day of term, and the storeroom of the junior school had been turned into a shop. The various parts of the uniform, the scarlet blouses, the skirts, the belts, the lace-up boots, the black stockings, were piled up in heaps on the counters. There were fifteen customers altogether. Fifteen infants from the kindergarten, all standing in a straight row, waiting to be bewitched into a real Archbishop Bodkin, Archbishop Bodkin foundlings. Mrs Meadle was in charge. Mrs Meadle was nice. Sweetie could tell that at once. She was so fat that she looked soft all over. As for her assistant, Nurse Savage, she was quite different. She was hard. Everything about her was hard. Nevertheless, Sweetie admired her. She had never seen anyone so quick with a tape measure. When the infants first filed into the storeroom, the tape measures were hanging over her shoulders like a necklace. Then, as the pig girl came in front of her, first she whipped off the cotton frock that the pig girl was wearing and began measuring so rapidly that Sweetie couldn't understand how she could read the figures on the tape. Twenty-six, she began calling out to Mrs Meadle. Twelve, twenty-four. And before the pig girl knew what was happening, she had been pushed sharply into the small of the back by Nurse Savage, and Mrs. and Mrs. Meadle was easing a blue serge skirt over her head. Even though Mrs. Meadle was gentle, she was quick too. The pile of uniforms grew smaller, and the pile of cotton frocks and the strap shoes grew beside it. In Canon Mallow's day, Mrs. Meadle used to have her mouth full of pins as she nipped the blouses in over the shoulders or marked the place on the side of the skirt with a piece of chalk where the buttons should go. After all, the uniforms weren't new. They weren't even second hand. They were third or fourth or fifth or even sixth hand. And little girls, even all of the same age, aren't by any means at all the same size. That's why the wash workrooms had been kept so busy. But Dr Trump had put an end to all of that. On his orders, three of the seamstresses had been dismissed and two others were now engaged solely on necessary repairs. In the result, the uniforms looked more uniform than ever. It was obvious that the blouses and skirts and cloaks were exactly as they had been it was obvious that the blouses and skirts and cloaks were all exactly as they had left the manufacturers and that the occupants had, one by one, been firmly fitted afterwards. It was the bear girl that caused the trouble. Sweetie had always known that she was a very... Sweetie had always known that she was a very fat little girl, but she had never known quite how fat she was until she'd been s until she had seen her stat Sorry, the bear girl is the fat one, not Sweetie. Um so I've read that slightly uh, misleading as I've just discovered. It was the bear girl, I'll read it again. It was the bear girl that caused all the trouble. Sweetie had always known that she was a, a, a very fat little girl, but she had never known quite how fat she was until she was until she had seen her standing there in her vest and knickers while Mrs Meadle went searching through the pile of skirts and blouses trying to find something that would fit. It was at this point that Mrs Gurnett came in. She caught sight of the bear girl straight away. Why is that girl standing there with nothing on? she demanded. She'll catch her death of cold. She's so enormous, Mrs Meadle replied. There's nothing to fit her. Then get something from grade two, Mrs Gurnett retorted. She can't go about naked just because she's fat. But anything that goes round her will be too long, Mrs Meadle pointed out. If Dr Trump wants to have the girls falling over their hems, that's his affair, not mine.
Mrs Gurnett retorted. Then we'll have another go with this one, Mrs Meadle said hopefully. Perhaps there's a pleat we could let out. So she turned to Sweetie as she was speaking. And just you wait there, she said. You aren't going to be any trouble, I can see that. You're just a sl tiny slip of a thing. It was Nurse Savage who supplied the scissors, and with them she began to open the box pleat that ran down the back of the scarlet blouse. Then she stopped. It's no use, she said. It'll have to be a grade two. She turned to the, bur to the bear girl. Stay where you are, she said firmly. I'm coming back. The bear girl stood there without moving. She was not a particularly bright girl, but at least she was obedient. She was ready to stand anywhere for hours if she was told to do so. Behind her, however, was Sweetie, and Sweetie was impatient. Meadle was... She wanted to get, sorry, she, uh, Sweetie was impatient. She wanted to get into her uniform, and because she liked Mrs Meadle, she wanted to be helpful. She wanted to save her from all the trouble that she could. So she took up the scissors herself. They were very sensible scissors with long, sharp points. If she really got to work with them, she was sure that she could make the bear girl's blouse so that it fitted properly. Then everyone would be pleased, Nurse Savage, Mrs Meadle, Mrs Gurnett and Mr Trump, Dr Trump, and of course the bear girl herself. Stand still, Sweetie said to the bear girl. I'm going to do something. What? asked the bear girl. Make your blouse so it fits, Sweetie told her. How? asked the bear girl. With my scissors, Sweetie told her. Oh, said the bear girl. She was surprised that Sweetie should have any sweet, uh, scissors, but she didn't care to argue. Sweetie was such a masterful little girl, and there was always trouble if anyone tried to stop her doing anything. All the same, she gave a shudder as Sweetie pushed the scissors up inside the blouse of the, from the bottom, and she very nearly cried out because the point pricked her. But Sweetie was very firm and decided about it all. Don't wriggle, she whispered, or I'll hurt you. Then Mrs Meadle will be cross. It is difficult cutting things from the inside, very difficult, but it was the only way in which Sweetie could do it if other people weren't to see what she was doing, and Sweetie wanted it all to be a surprise. She wanted Mrs Meadle to come back and find that all her work had been done for her. That was why she went on cutting slowly, carefully, putting her tongue out a little because she was concentrating so hard. Then she reached the top, and as she made the last snick, the bear girl's blouse fell apart over her shoulder, and Sweetie found herself looking at the bear girl's naked back. She must have made a mistake somewhere. Sweetie realised that. Now, and she saw that she had cut right through the bear girl's vest as well, now Mrs Meadle wouldn't be pleased at all. She might be very angry, in fact. And that, that was why Sweetie put the scissors down again on the table. Even so, Mrs Meadle might have been ready to forgive her. What Mrs Gurnett couldn't forgive, however, was that Sweetie wouldn't own up. But how could she? Who's the naughty girl who's done this? Is it you? Mrs Meadle demanded, staring straight at Sweetie, and Sweetie could only shake her head. She was trying to explain that she wasn't naughty, just helpful. Then everyone got cross at once. And because they were cross, Sweetie started to cry. And worse, she got cross too. She hit the bear girl for getting her into so much trouble. And that was why Sweetie was sent to Dr Trump. It was serious deeply serious when anyone went and was sent to see Dr Trump. And for an infant who had only that day gone into the junior school, it was unheard of. There was a gasp from Mrs Meadle when Mrs Gurnett threatened it. The other children, the pig girl, the girl with the sheepdog hair, the bear girl, stood round silent, fascinated, appalled. I mean it. Mrs Gurnett went on. Over to Dr Trump you go. 
It was Mrs. Meadle who was the first to speak. She came forward and put her hand on Sweetie's shoulder. I'm sure you didn't mean to do it, she said. You're just a very silly little girl who didn't think. You can't send her to Dr. Trump for being silly. Mrs. Gurnett faced Mrs. Meadle angrily. I'm not sending her. I'm taking her she replied. If you want to be responsible for a size one vest that can't be worn again, I don't. There was a pause and no one spoke again. Come along, Mrs Gurnett said. They had reached the warden's off corridor by now. Dr Trump's study stood on the far end of it. Down the corridor they went, Mrs Gurnett leading. Then, at the door, she stopped. Wait here, she said. She raised her hand to knock on the door, but before her knuckles had touched the panel of the door, Dr Trump stood there with a small, red-headed boy beside him. The small boy was rubbing his eyes with his fist. "'Let that be a lesson to you,' Dr Trump was saying, swishing the air with his cane as he was speaking. "'Let us see who tries... let us see who tires of this treatment first. The small, red-headed boy looked up and saw Sweetie standing there, and he resented her. He didn't like to be seen crying. Then he recognised something about her. It was her eyes. They seemed so much larger than the eyes of the other little girls. For a moment he forgot all about Dr Trump. Hello, he said. Sweetie's eyes opened wider still. Oh! Hello, she answered. That was Sweetie's and Ginger's second meeting. It was the 7th of September, 1928, on which it took place. Sweetie was six and Ginger seven. Sorry about the, uh, the appalling reading. The text is quite, uh, quite uh, tight, that's my excuse. Chapter 14 The kitchens of the Archbishop Bodkin Hotel were long, low and rounded like converted railway tunnels. Up to six feet, the walls of the kitchen were painted a deep bottle green. Next, a dado of dark chocolate ran round the whole interior. And finally, the upper walls and ceiling carried a coat of smooth, salty distemper. The whole effect was both serviceable and sedative, and also strangely smothering. It was as though the decorator had risen temporarily from some submarine existence to choose and supervise his colour scheme. At this moment, ten o'clock on the morning of Wednesday the 3rd, Mrs Gurnett was standing at one end of the kitchen beside a small table that was bare, except for a pair of kitchen scales and a metal spike on which was impaled the day's collection of tradesmen's bills and store accounts. She was not looking at them, however. She was not even thinking of them. Instead, she was gazing down the long line of white scrubbed tables at which the kitchen staff were working. They all looked exactly alike, these women, dressed in the blue and white striped working uniform of the hospital. And facing each other across the tabletops, they conveyed the air of a oh, cotillish, cotillion of wardresses. Not heard of that word before. Cotillion. C-O-T-I-L-L-O-N. Cotillion. I think that's how it's pronounced. But Mrs. Gurnett was not even. Th but Mrs. Gurnett was not even thinking of the women. She was adding up the figures in her head, private figures, figures that no one except herself and the bank manager knew anything about. It was the mystical number 459 that kept swimming before her eyes, and as she gazed at it, illuminated as brightly as if in neon, she was reasoning silently to herself. Not yet, she cautioned, not before it is the full 500. 
I mustn't do anything that I will regret later. There's only me to consider. But once I've burned my boats, where am I? Who's going to step forward if anything goes wrong? It'll take three years, she went on to herself, every month of it, and only if I'm careful at that. But if it isn't then, it's never. I shall be too old for it. No patients of mine are ever going to say that I can't do justice by them. And the thought of patients of her own, not mere Archbishop, Bodkin, weaklings, but real paying patients with laundry and cotton wool as extras, Mrs Gurnett's soul became suffused with a warm inner radiance. She saw it as the one thing in life worth living for. Her own private nursing home, with her own private operating theatre, her own private sterilisers, her own private nursing fees, even the words on the brass plate set above the gatepost, the, La, the La Morna Nursing Establishment, resident matron Mrs Gurnett. They were plain to her. She had decided already in favour of the engraver's script for the lettering because it looked less cold somehow in Roman. That is, if I can stick at it for another three years, she reminded herself. That's the limit and I can't go beyond it. It's in his hands as much as mine. And then she became aware of somebody who was beside her and turning sharply she found herself face to face with Dr Trump. Ah, said Dr Trump, his face creased in readiness for the smile he always used on such occasions. I fear I have startled you. Mrs Gurnett's chin stiffened and the crescent of her mouth descended sharply. Did you want something? she asked. Dr Trump's smile remained fixed and purposeful. I wish to see the kitchens, he replied. Mrs Gurnett did not move. Well, there they are. That's all there is of them. Then perhaps we might go round together, Dr Trump suggested. Now, Mrs Gurnett asked, just when there's lunch to get. And what better time could there be, Dr Trump inquired. Mrs Gurnett was about to tell him. Then the figure of £500 rose up before her, clear and tantalising, and she checked herself. I'm ready, was all she said. As the two of them advanced along the centre gangway, a rigid and unnatural silence descended upon the room, and at the realisation of what this sudden hush portended, Dr Trump smiled, a genuine and unpremeditated smile, a smile of sheer gratification at this latest proof of his tremendous presence. He turned to Mrs Gurnett, are they happy at their work? I'll soon hear about it if they weren't, she replied. Then let us put it to the test, Dr Trump proposed. Let us speak with some of them. He paused opposite one shapeless aproned figure and addressed it. As he spoke, the girl turned round. She was a large, vacant-looking girl with a flat, white face across which tendrils of pale hair were straying. By now Dr Trump was wearing his smile again. And what might your name be, may I ask? he inquired. The girl appeared puzzled as though there was a catch in the question somewhere. Mrs Gurnett came to her assistance. He asked you your name, Annie, she, she explained. Oh, Annie, sir, the girl repeated in a whisper, as though imparting a closely guarded secret. She had somehow the air of a lunar visitor who had been captured and held for questioning. Well, Annie, Dr Trump went on, and what is it we have here? It's rice pudding, Mrs Gurnett interjected, but Dr Trump motioned her to stop. I want to talk to her myself, he explained. There was a pause. Well, Dr Trump insisted, Tell me. Thrice, the girl confirmed in the same hoarse whisper. And uh, do, do, you make, do you enjoy making rice pudding? 
Dr. Trump inquired. This time, the girl merely smiled back at him nervously. She had never had this question put to her before and needed Mrs. Gurnett to help with the answer. Dr. Trump overlooked her silence. Uh, and um, rice puddings, is that all you make? He went on. Again the smile. Again the look of complete bewilderment. Are you, in fact, happy? Dr. Trump asked her point blank. It was this question that really floored her. She could not make head nor tail of it, couldn't understand this insatiable questioner who was interested only in, in, in enjoyment and happiness. So she smiled again and wiped her forehead with her apron sleeve. Dr. Trump smiled back at her. That's all I want to know, he said. As they moved off, Dr. Trump turned to Mrs. Gurnett. She doesn't appear to be a particularly bright sort of girl, he said quietly. She isn't, Mrs. Gurnett replied. But then why employ her? Because she's cheap, Mrs. Gurnett snapped back at him. Oh, how much? Ten shillings a week and her keep? She is an old bodki bodkinian, remember? Dr. Trump's eyebrows came together with a little wiggle. He was frowning. Hmm. How many of them are there? he asked. Who? These hired girls. Six, Mrs. Gurnett replied. There should be more. I've asked for them. Dr. Trump ignored the second half of the question. Six at ten shillings a week, Mrs. Gurnett nodded. A hundred and fifty... Ah, oh, yes, a hundred and fifty a year, Dr. Trump observed disapprovingly. And he could not... And could... Oh, oh, and could not the older girls in the hospital perform these simple duties, he inquired. Cooking isn't simple, Mrs. Gurnett replied. Mm, but parts of it are, Dr. Trump pointed out. The, uh, the washing up, for example. The children do the washing up, you mean? Precisely, Mrs. Gurnett sniffed. <laughs> There'd be breakages, she said. They'd need too much looking after. But, Dr. Trump reminded her, this is where, this is what you're here for, to look after them. I couldn't hold myself responsible, Mrs. Gurnett replied briefly. There was a pause, a long, awkward pause. We shall see, Dr. Trump replied enigmatically. We shall see. Golly. It was on that, it was on the first Thursday of the month that the board meetings were held. And as the calendar moved round towards this one, Dr. Trump found himself growing steadily happier with every day that passed. By the first Tuesday of April, he had his speech word perfect. By the, yes, and on the Wednesday night, he could not sleep for thinking of it. Appropriately, Dame Eleanor placed the item first on the agenda. Proposed economies in catering and management, Dr Trump. That was how it was read. And the meeting proceeded, wrapped up. And the meeting proceeded, wrapped in Canon Larkin's approving smile. Even the minute was... Ex every, sorry, even the minute... Even the minute? Even the minute was exactly... Oh, yes, the minute is the, the minutes being taken. Even the minute was exactly as Dr. Trump would most like to have seen it. Agreed, the paragraph ran, agreed to provide more practical instruction in domestic science and housewifery, girls in senior grades to assist in kitchens under close supervision, so, close supervision from Mrs. Gurnett, estimate saving for the year to... Uh, 1929 to 1930, £175 an annum. The board thanked Dr Trump for his proposals. So he's getting on with his cost-saving um, scheme. How are we doing out there in uh, listening land? Uh, we have Andrew Norris. Hello, Andrew Norris. Nice to see you. And Josh Hastings. Hello. Lagging behind, but uh, now I've lost the plot. This is the trouble. If you if you, if you don't listen to every every syllable, you will lose the plot. I've sneaked in quietly this time. Yes. Yeah, so uh, he's still going on in his savings, and basically, what's happened is um, 
Mrs. Gurnett is uh, secretly trying to save up enough money so that she can open up her own nursing home. Uh, Sweetie and Ginger have met for a second time. Um, and Dr. Trump is weaving his magic to get into Dame Eleanor's good books by cutting costs. That seems to be the thing. But there's a sort of, you know, underlying rumbling going on. So uh, that's pretty much it. We are now on chapter 15. Got time to start this if you're ready for it. It was a Wednesday, one of Bishop Warple's midweeks. And now, he was saying as he looked at his watch, no doubt the invalid will be ready for us. The bishop's habit of referring to his wife in this way had already conjured up alarming pictures in Dr Trump's mind. He saw Mrs Warple as someone, almost something, lying there, emaciated, grey, inert, in pain probably, voice a mere whisper, each breath drawn only with difficulty, strength just sufficient to extend a limp, feeble hand towards her future son-in-law. It was, in fact, he was, in fact, dreading the encounter and feared that at any moment he might break down under the sheer emotional strain of it. Nor did Bishop Warpole's next remark do anything to reassure him. Perhaps my little Felicity had better go up first and see if everything's in order, he suggested. We don't want to surprise the invalid, do we? <laughs> Can you imagine this talking of your wife as the invalid? It's a, it's a lovely little observation, I think, there. As he uttered the last words, he gave Dr Trump's arm a coy, affectionate squeeze and dropped a word of explanation into his ear. Her nerves, he said vaguely. Any sudden shock, you understand. Oh, uh, just so, Dr Trump replied. I I'll be most careful. Oh, I'm sure you will, Bishop Warple answered. But we can't afford to take the risks. Dr Trump shook his head. He was, by temperament, decisively opposed to risks, and above all he was anxious to avoid them on this occasion. "'You don't think it might be better to postpone it altogether?' he began, hopefully. Uh, "'Perhaps some other day?' But Bishop Warple would hear none of it. "'Oh, no, no,' he said. "'That would never do. Not after we've told her.' Might as well go up now, he continued, but we mustn't stay long. We don't want to overtire her. There was a screen inside the bedroom door, and Dr Trump tiptoed gingerly around it. As he did so, he was conscious of two things. The overpowering heat of the room, a large gas fire was burning fiercely through it, Oh, sorry, it was burning fiercely, though it was still early September, and the richly medicated atmosphere. It was like stepping into a chemist's warehouse. Immediately he was enveloped in an ode, odour of eau de Cologne. It was like stepping into a chemist's warehouse. Immediately he was enveloped in an odour of eau de Cologne. Lavender water, menthol, friar's balsam, camphor, hot water bottles, disinfectant, toothpaste. It was the very attire of sick rooms. And, and as he raised his eyes, he found himself confronting the invalid, a large, spongy-looking woman in a brightly coloured bed jacket. There was a soft, almost transparent waxiness of her complexion that he found oddly disturbing. If the temperature of the room went up even by two or three degrees, it seemed to him that she might start melting before his eyes onto the bedclothes. Come in, Dr Trump, she said. And as she said it, she thrust out her hand. Dr Trump took it timidly, and immediately he regretted having done so, for he found himself being pulled irresistibly forward. But it was too late. 
With a sudden jerk, Mrs. Warple had kissed him. Uh, how do you do? Dr. Trump asked awkwardly. He was still attempting to withdraw his hand, but Mrs. Warple had no intention of letting go. We're going to be great friends, I can see that, she went on. You must come and sit with me. I indeed, yes, he replied faintly. Many, many times. Considering her delicate state of health, the strength of Mrs. Warple's grip was really most surprising. But, also, but so also was her whole appearance. It was evident that, unlike most chronic invalids, she had not let herself go. She was unmistakably... It was... Sorry. It was unmistakably lipstick that she had on. She was wearing jewellery, large imitation pearl earrings which were fixed to each ear, and she had a string of little objects around her throat. From the close range that he was inspecting her, Dr Trump decided that she must be brave, very brave. Obviously undefeatable, in fact. But not, but somehow not spiritual. He drew back and found Felicity whispering into his ear. She likes you, she said simply. Dr Trump didn't know what to say. He only wished that a note of re he only wished that the note of relief of surprise even in Felicity's voice had not been so pronounced. But he was not paying attention to Felicity any longer. He was staring instead at Mrs. Warple. For instead of reaching out for her smelling salts or even her Bible, Mrs. Warple had taken a cigarette from a common cardboard packet that lay among the bedclothes, and when she lit it, she blew out a thick cloud of smoke and sank back among the pillows. This time it was Bishop Warple who whispered. He'd obviously been anxiously observing Dr Trump's face, and when he caught his eye he spoke. The doctors advised it, he said in a strained half voice, for it smooths, for its smoothing qualities, nerves, you know. She takes no pleasure in it. Quite so, Dr Trump agreed. Mrs Warple, however, appeared to be making the best of it. She blew out another cloud and half-closed her eyes. You don't know what it means, taking my felicity away from me, she said in a deep, melancholy-sounding voice. She's all I have now, you know. Before Dr Trump could reply, however, Bishop Warple had come to his assistance. He advanced to the foot of the bed and laid his hand on the ma mahogany end piece. My, my pet, he said sweetly, you have me. Not always I haven't, Mrs Warple con contradicted him. You've al you're always going out somewhere. But only on my duties. The bishop tried to reason with her. I haven't done what you might call... I haven't done what you might... Sorry. I haven't done what you might call... In... Oh. I haven't done what you might call enjoy myself for years. He stopped himself abruptly and sta started to rephrase the sentence. I mean, what I should say... But Mrs Warple, however, had closed her eyes and seemed no longer to be listening. Some men seem to think women were created simply f for waiting on them, she observed to no one in particular. Bishop Warple smiled and shook his head. Ah, Samuel, I'm afraid... Oh, yes, I I'm trying to work out who's talking. Ah, Samuel, I'm afraid the invalid knows us all too well. We are all men, poor sinners, even the best of us. Quite so, quite so, Dr Trump politely agreed with him. And nobody thinks of the hours I spend here alone, Mrs Warple went on. She opened her eyes by now and had fixed them on the ceiling. Hours and hours while nobody comes near me. Dr Trump drew in a deep breath. A happy thought had come to him. Had... Here, before him, lay his opportunity to ingratiate himself, to demonstrate his thoughtfulness. Why not have a wireless? he asked. The talks, you know, and the music, and of course the sermons. 
There was a shock, hush. There was a shocked hush at the suggestion. Mrs. Warple didn't even trouble to reply. The bishop looked down at his gaiters, and it was Felicity who spoke for all of them. Not with mother's bad head, she said, reapprove, reprovingly. Alas, no, the bishop had said sadly. We tried it. It's no use. It's up in my study now. Oh, don't bother about me, Mrs. Warple said suddenly, as though she'd been screwing up her courage to speak at all. I don't count any longer. I'm just a poor old invalid. I'm better out of the way so that happy people can forget all about me. An expression crossed Bishop Warple's face as though he had heard all of this before. He pulled out his watch rather conspicuously and began fiddling with it. Good gracious, he said, as soon as he could be sure that everyone would hear him. My ordinance, uh, I must be going. I, I, I am uh, really overdue. I am late, in fact. Yes, very late, very. The thought of being left behind there, after Bishop Warple had gone, came over Dr Trump in a panic. He realised that he must do something and do it quickly. Oh, yes, and um, <clears throat> I gave my word that I would not overtire you he said. Uh, next time, perhaps you will allow me to stay longer, uh, much longer. Uh, there must be so much to tell each other. The bishop had already begun to make his way towards the door, and Dr Trump started to follow. But Mrs Warple was too quick for him. She snatched hold of his hand again, and again the soft, damp octopus embrace. I don't know why Felicity, Felicity should want to leave here, she began. She's got everything she wants here. Nobody tells her anything. She rules the house. Ah, said Bishop Warple in a tone of great defeat. I hear the nurse coming. In the corridor outside, Dr Trump nearly bumped into the woman. She was carrying Dr Warple's supper tray. Sorry, she was carrying Mrs Warple's supper tray. The corridor was narrow and the tray was a wide one. As he flattened himself against the wall, Dr Trump found himself inspecting the contents like a restaurant supervisor. There was a small casserole of soup, a silver dish from under the cover of which escaped an appetising odour of onions, and the two halves of a meringue glued together by a layer of whipped cream. It was none of these that Dr Trump was looking at. His eyes was fixed on the bottle of milk, stout, that stood back, sorry. His eyes were fixed on a bottle of milk stout that stood black and irrelevant looking beside the china toast rack. Bishop, Bishop Warple caught Dr Trump's eye for a second time. Oh, for medicinal purposes, he said. She needs nourishment, you know. Sometimes when there's lots of these characters all talking at once, it's quite tricky to keep the voices and then know who's talking. Because I've not... I've read the book before, but obviously I'm not familiar with each of the chapters and the words as they come, so sometimes I'm just trying to guess who's talking and then remember how they talk. Um, but uh, there we are. We're at, we're at ten two, and just come to another longish chapter, so I won't endeavour to do that. But it does start with Mr Pavarius, who is a character that I'm beginning to like very much. But unfortunately, uh, I won't go into his world quite yet. I think we'll join him next time tomorrow. I hope you enjoyed that. Sorry about sometimes my appalling reading. I, it really bugs me, but uh, people are very nice. So <sighs> it, it, it seems to jog, jog, jog along. Uh, they just don't make them like this these days. I remember characters from when, like that, when I was little. Sounds good, Richard. Thank you very much. Thank you, Josh. Uh, I always sneak in wearing my slippers, says Andrew Norris. Good for you. Milk Stout, Edna Sharples. Milk Stout in high iron, yes. You're a one-man band, Richard, says Lee Lawson. Well, I try, but uh, I ought to really read the chapter and just practice it before I perform it, but I just don't get the time. Um, but anyway... So sorry about that. Really, you know, I'm one of those people that wants to try and give the best. And I know half the time I'm not quite doing it. But as long as you get the general idea, that's all that matters. Good stuff. Anyway, everyone's uh, enjoying it. So that's good. Thank you so much. Um, 
I'm going to do a little bit of research for possibly tomorrow's video um, and get my dinner ready. And then there's the uh, Vogue show this evening at eight. So lots to do. Thank you very much for coming along. Um, there is tomorrow's video is already made. Tomorrow's video is a bit of a personal thing. I won't say any more about that. So I'm talking about what's tomorrow? Thursday. So this will be Friday's video I'm researching for. Anyway, that's uh, neither here nor there. Hope that you're all warm and keeping going. Thank you very much for joining me today. I will see you tomorrow, if not this evening on The Vogue Show. So, uh, excuse me. Take care. Look after yourselves. And thank you for coming along this afternoon. Take all the best. Bye for now. Bye bye. <laughs>